as you know, we're, we're doing a, a, an intro to SEO. Okay, so as I was just saying before, it's pitched at, the, at, at an introductory level. And what I'm going to do is just give you some quick tips about SEO. So today is really an introductory uh, session. And we do have the option later, if there's time and schedule and interest allows, we might look at a, a more advanced SEO topic later. Um, might do it after hours or something like that, we'll see. We can chat about that separately. But today is really just an introduction of the basics. And I also want to go through some tools with you, things like Google Analytics, which is something that I then want you to set up today. I'm not sure how today is structured in terms of what you've got to do, but I'm around all day and setting up, help, helping you set up some of these tools is, is what I'd be keen to do uh, because uh, they're quite important for, for web developers to know. So just a little bit about me. Uh, my name's Craig Bailey. Uh, hi. <laughs> I run a company called Zen Systems, and we're, we're a digital agency. Uh, we're small, and uh, we look after SEO and online strategy for clients, and I do a fair bit of analytics training as well. Uh, but my background is actually as a developer. So I was a developer for 20 years, uh, more than 20 years. I was a database developer and then a web developer. And uh, I was a Microsoft MVP in 2007 to 2009 as well. And after that, um, I went more from developing stuff to more promoting stuff, so the online marketing side of sites. So no longer developing sites, but more promoting the sites. That's a little bit about me. So I kind of have a technical background, and uh, that's kind of my focus today. So today's goals. We're going to go through three things. The first is an introduction to SEO. I'm just going to tell you what that means and what it covers and some things to be aware of. Second thing is I want to go through some tools that you can get implemented as soon as possible. And then the third thing, depending on time and, and how we go, is just the importance of content. And we'll look at, a, at kind of how we develop content for the sites and also pick up on something that Andrew Coates covered weeks ago, which was around this idea of an online profile. So your blogs and things like that and, and the importance of that, how that all feeds in, into Google. So at the end, here's, here's kind of what I, w at the end, if I've succeeded, here's what I want you to take away. I kind of want you to understand the basics of SEO. I'd like you to set up a Google account if you don't already have one. I'd like you to set up Google Analytics. I'd like you to set up Google Webmaster Tools. I'd like you to set up Bing Webmaster Tools, okay? These are all really quite easy to do, and I'll go through each of them. Um, I'd like you to understand the value of good content, and I'd also like you to be understanding or starting to be thinking about this concept of keywords and ranking for uh, specific terms and also understanding your audience, what they'd be searching for, thinking about your customer. So that's, uh, that's kind of how we're going to go. Um, actually, just before I get into what I see, I'll just tell you the format. So today I've got a whole bunch of slides um, ready, but I don't really want to spend a lot of time in the slides. I'm actually going to flip out to the tools and we'll, look at, we'll spend most of our time in the browser. But in terms of the format, I'm really keen to make it interactive. So it's always hard to pitch a presentation. Is it too simple, too basic? So I'll just rely on your feedback, OK? If there's something I'd just gloss over, just pull me up. If, I'm, if it's too basic, just give me the yeah, yeah kind of signal. And I'm, yeah, I'm more than happy for you to interrupt. So I'm happy for this to kind of change course as we go along. But I'll give you a few int introductory points. So what is SEO? And uh, uh, SEO, is, it stands for Search Engine Optimization. Uh, some of you know that. But what is Search Engine Optimization? Well, it is kind of what it, what it sounds like. And it's optimizing your site so that Google will rank it higher. But then what does optimizing mean? And that's really what we're going to talk about today. It's really how the site is presented so that Google can rank it higher. Now, what is SEO? It's search engine optimization. It's also about maximizing the number of keywords that drive traffic to your site. So in Google, when you search for something, we want to be kind of ranking for as many of those as possible. We want to increase traffic to the site. However, it's also about matching the right kind of traffic. Okay, so it's not just about traffic for traffic site. It's actually about matching what your site delivers to who your audience is, who your appropriate audience is, who your customer is. And it's all well and good to you know, rank for the term Miley Cyrus, but if you're selling a SaaS product, that's no value at all, okay? 
Um, and the other part of SEO really is about actively monitoring it and improving it. So SEO is not just a set and forget. It's just not like, you know, just do these few things and, and we're all good. As you know, the Google rankings are always changing. So it's, there's this kind of ongoing process of what's happening, what's changing, are there issues with my site, let's improve it. That incremental ongoing improvement, that's, that's SEO as well. So does that make sense so far? Let me just check. Is that, is that all good? Or am I? If, if, if anyone's, um, if you want me to cover anything else, just let me know. So I'll push on. What, what I wanted to do, before we dive into you know, the technical bits and the hands-on bits, I actually want to take a step back and, and think about why we build a website in the first place. Okay? And really what I'm getting at here is business goals. And I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on this. Uh, because I think it's really important as web developers that we kind of understand this approach, what the website we're building is for, and also more importantly, if you're going to be .NET developers for, say, a company like SSW or other consulting companies, when you're placed as a consultant into an enterprise or something to deliver a solution, it's really important that you're thinking about what are the business goals for that client. And too often you, you kind of see developers go in, even senior developers, they'll go in and they think, well, just give me the requirements, um, and in their mind they're thinking, right, and it's, <laughs> I've done this, maybe you've done this, it's all about, well, what's the cool framework that I can use to deliver this solution, right, or what's the new technology I can play with, you know, this is going to be fun. And we've got to have fun developing, right, but it's about a balance, and sometimes the balance skews too far to just getting stuff done, but not actually being in tune with what the business goals for the client is. So this is really important. So why build a website? And what I'm saying is, well, w to drive traffic to it, obviously, and traffic comes from a variety of sources, and we're going to touch on that first one, organic, today, which is the Google stuff. But there's a whole bunch of other sources, paid, social, referral, direct email campaigns, all that kind of stuff. So we want to drive traffic, but we want it to be the right kind of traffic. And for that website, so for our client, we're developing a website, they've probably got some conversion process in mind, how they want to convert a client. Now, that could be getting them to sign up for a service, could be buying something if it's an e-commerce site. It could be just awareness. You're, try, you're a not-for-profit. You're trying to get awareness of, a, of an issue out. It could just be for advertising. You know, you just want eyeballs on the site. So there's all these different kinds of conversion ideas that a site might have and different customers that you might be appealing to, customer or audience. And ultimately, though, most websites have a financial component. They want to make money. Not all cases, but most of the cases. And even if you're working, you know, say you're doing a big government website where you might think, look, it's not really about money. Actually, it probably is because someone's probably got to justify the budget for that site, even if it's just the development this year, but even the maintenance of it next year. So getting our mindset around what are the business goals for a website is really important as developers. Now, today, we're just going to touch on kind of the start of that, driving traffic. But I really wanted to make kind of harp on this point that we really need to be thinking of the whole process. As developers, as we become uh, more experienced developers, understanding the business goals behind a website is really important. So any questions on that or any comments on that? Anyway, is that, um, is that uh, interesting to people or is it, is it perhaps annoying? <laughs> Don't annoy me with what the company wants. I just want to build the site, you know? So I, I get that. I was, I've done that plenty of times. But Okay, so um, this, uh, just to kind of set the scene, if you're looking at marketing for a website, uh, you know there's offline marketing or um, uh, other, you know, TV or that kind of stuff. Um, but then in the online marketing space, uh, this kind of umbrella term we talk about, uh, online marketing, marketing, we've got the paid stuff, we've got direct, we've got social, and then we've got SEO, the organic stuff. And quite often we think of this as the free traffic, although, as we know, there's a lot of hard work and time and cost that goes into ranking for stuff. But today we're really looking at that organic part. And when it comes to SEO, there's kind of on-page SEO and off-page SEO. These things I'm talking about, we'll, we'll actually kind of review them, keep coming back to them, but this is kind of broadly setting it up. 
And today we're really mostly going to talk about the on-page SEO. And by that I mean the stuff that we can actually do on the site. Okay? Off-page, just to let you know, stuff like getting links from people, recommendations from other sites, that kind of stuff. So let's think about the Google algorithm, and uh, I'm really just going to refer to Google, but this includes Bing and Yahoo, and there's hundreds of search engines, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, let's just talk about the algorithms and how they rank stuff. And this is still the high, kind of high-level stuff, just setting the scene. Um, you, you may be aware that Google um, uses hundreds of input factors, and these are changing over time. So it's not just like three things you've got to do, there's hundreds of them. They're continually testing stuff, and uh, in the past, Google has actually said they test uh, any number of variations each week or daily. They're always testing things, so it's not like they just do one kind of... We, we, you kind of hear sometimes about these Google algorithm changes, and we think it's like, oh, it happens three times a year. No, it's happening every day. They're testing things. So it's constantly changing, and um, the other thing about it is that the, the results that you get are personalised, and this is m becoming more the case. So the, s the results you get, even on just different devices, or just different browsers on the same machine, will often be different. Search for a term on one browser, it's different to the results you get in another. And that's because it's been personalised based on thing, your previous history, what you've looked at, all that kind of stuff. Also, your location and device. You search for, like, airport on your mobile, you're probably going to get a different result than on your desktop. Okay, so we know that it, that's reasonably complex as it is, and then um, the Google algorithm takes into, ca into uh, its uh, calculations on-page items, and today I'm going to talk about page titles, and off-page items, which is uh, getting links from other sites. Um, High-quality content is important, it's becoming more important. Gone are the days when you could just rank any old rubbish based on some spammy links. Uh, it's the, the push to quality is definitely on. Now, that's not to say you won't find rubbish when you search in Google or Bing. So it's, it's not perfect, but it's definitely getting better quality. The other thing that I wanted to tell you about the Google algor algorithm and Bing as well is that if you're a big brand, that helps. Okay? And uh, the reason I say this is because if you're a small, if you've got a small website and you get penalised, have you ever heard about getting penalised in Google? Is that something you've... Okay, I'll tell you a little bit about penalties. It's, it's when Google has these guidelines, right? They think they, they think they control the world, and they kind of do in some ways. And so they put out guidelines where they tell you what's right or wrong to do. And y you, can, you can often think that, well, they're like a law unto themselves, you know, like if I break their guidelines, am I doing something wrong? No, you just you get penalised by Google. It's not like it's legal crime or anything, but the way some people think about it is you get penalised, it's like you've broken the law. It's, it's, that's how kind of strong Google is. But um, getting back to brands, if you ever get penalised, which what happens is your site just completely falls out of Google. You're searching for your site one day, and then the next day it's just gone. Very, you know, a bit of a heart attack. But when you get penalised, if you're a small, small website, it's very hard to get back in. If you're a big brand, you'll get back in a couple of weeks. You just kind of cry, cry, you know, apologies and that kind of thing, you get back in. The reason I'm telling you this is because you might think, well, a big brand website is ranking for all these terms. I'll just go and look at what they're doing and I'll just copy it, right? It makes sense. And, and to a certain extent, you would do that. You go, oh, well, they're obviously working. I'll, I'll do some of that. I'm just saying, it's not always the case. So sometimes they get away with stuff that you and I can't get away with. Anyway, just to quickly recap that, Google algorithm, quite complex, yeah. Okay, so that's a good question. So Adam's asked, what kind of things will get you penalised? What would, you know, you wake up one morning and, and you're out? Now, the, the answer to that is there's tons of things you can do, plus it's changing. But I'll give you some, um, uh, just some examples recently. If you build, have you ever seen when you get those spammy links? So you've got a blog and you get these comment notifications and someone, it's just a spammy comment and it's got a link in it, get all that? That's because about five years ago, if you spammed comments, you were building links into the, you know, the comment part of people's sites. So the thinking was, if I get all these links from all these comment blogs, all these links, Google will look at these links and say, oh, well, everyone's linking to me. This site must be better. And it actually worked. Like, 
five years ago, maybe ten years ago. It hasn't worked for years. I don't know why we still get all this comment spam. But that's an example. So but Google basically cut down on that, and if they notice you were, all your links to your site that previously propped you up in the rankings were spammy backlinks, they're called, they basically started penalising sites for that. Now you might think, well, and <laughs> this is getting a bit off track, you might think, well, hey, let's say I want to be mean and kind of get someone else penalised. Well, I'll just build a whole bunch of spammy backlinks to them as well. And so then you've got this, this idea of negative SEO, I don't know if you've heard of this term, where you try and penalise other sites, and then so then the algorithm came back, we said, well, we've got to be more aware of this so that people can't just destroy someone else's. It all gets very complex. They have their whole bunch of signals where they try and work this out. I, 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 as much as I hate Google, I kind of love them in other ways, but it, they've got a very difficult job trying to work out what is quality. So that's one example. So then when that didn't, that stopped working, I'll just give you one more example. People started put building their own websites that just had rubbish content, so they'd, they'd basically say, I'm going to build a whole bunch of low-quality websites and just link back to my site, right? So you got this idea of blog networks where they were built purely just for creating sites that you could then put links on back to your site. And that worked for a while. And then Google comes out and says, well, hang on. <laughs> we've, we've wised up to this and we're basically going to penalise that behaviour as well. So there are kind of some examples, that kind of stuff. Back in the day, um, back in the day, like 10, 15 years ago, when this was all kind of the wild west of just manipulating Google. They, um, one of the things you could do on your site, so not off-site getting links, but on your site, you could include, you could hide all these dodgy keywords within your content. Yeah, and it was called keyword stuffing, and you, but you'd hide it so that only Google saw it, and that like worked for, I don't know, a year or two, and it's, that's 10 years ago, so Google clamped down that. Some big brands actually got caught out. I think BMW was famously caught out doing that, and then across that. <laughs> They apologised and fixed it. No, back in well, I thought a couple of months later, they might have got a three-month suspension. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah it's a good question. But um, all these kind of and by the way, all all you need to do is is try, kind of jump onto some of these SEO forums, and you'll get the latest tip for how to rank. You know, it's always something scalable and automated and spammy. Basically, to rank well for a while, you've got to be delivering content and working hard to promote it to get good quality links. If you're just building thousands of spammy backlinks, it might work briefly, but you, it's, it's not a long-term plan. But yeah. Okay, so the Google algorithm. Let's actually look at um, a, a um, Google result, and I'll actually just flip out to the browser now, and I'll try and do most of this from here if we can. And I'm just going to search for the term Fire Boot Camp. Because what I thought I'd do is I'd actually use Fire Boot Camp as an example today for most of the, most of the things we look at. And the reason for that is because it's actually a really new site. So it's quite new. It's just starting to rank for things. We're just starting to get uh, good content on it and improve it. Um, so it's probably a good example if we're just building our own websites to be thinking about, um, as opposed to some age site that's ranking well for everything, it's got thousands of visits and could be a little, little demoralising. So we're going to look at Fire Boot Camp. And I want you to notice a few things here, okay? So this is a typical Google result. First thing, see this, um, can you see, I don't know if you can see that colour shading, it's, it's quite, quite faint. Now, so what, what are that, what's that? Is that a Google result? Do we? Yep. Their ads, quite right. So um, it's good that you know that, but not, in fact, most people don't know that. They, they, they see this one at the top and they think, oh, that's the best result. Google's telling me that's the best result. These are actually paid. We're not really going to talk about that today unless you want to. We can talk about AdWords and advertising. But really, this one here is um, the uh, first organic result, the first natural result in Google. And I want you to notice two things. There's the, what I'll call the title or the heading, this is, is Fire Boot Camp. Um, and then this second, oh, there's actually three things, but two of them we're going to focus on. Second is the, the URL, which is useful. See how it's slightly bolded and matches our, shop, our search term. And then this third one, which is actually the second thing I'm going to harp on today, 
is the meta description. So that's that's a, that's a result. Now let's. I just want to show you if I actually go to the Fire Boot Camps. Um, oops, Fire Boot Camp uh, site. See this thing here. Don't know if you can. It's probably actually a better way to show it. I'll just flip over to Safari. Fire Boot Camp at the top of the browser or the tab. You see this uh, the Fire Boot Camp on it. That's actually called the title page title. So you're familiar with this in the code behind? Yeah. So the, the page title is actually one of the key influences on what Google ranks that page for. So uh, out of the hundreds of things that you could be doing for your site, this is actually the, the very first thing that I recommend you do, setting the page titles correctly because they basically directly flow into the search results. Now. I'm going to I'm going to harp on this because the in, in you know the 80 20 where it's kind of like um, do 20% and get 80% of the results. Getting your page titles right is the single best thing you can do for SEO. And I, I actually do work for government departments, and I'll go in and find like that page titles are not set, and just by fixing that on a government site can have a massive in, impact on their Google rankings. Okay, so don't underestimate it. Every 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 presentation you'll see on SEO will mention page titles, every article. And it is because it's really important. So th that's a key thing that I'll, I'll just harp on. And I'll actually, let me flip back and um, I'll just show you an example of where people get it wrong. And we're going to look at the source in a minute. Um, uh, did I not put it here? So here's an example. I don't know if you can see this, but um, here's a government site, uh, and that's their page title. Okay, so that's a massive opportunity they've missed out on there. They don't even have their brand or, or department name. So Google kind of has to guess um, what the site's about. And in fact, this little snippet I've overlaid here, oops, let me go back, sorry, is actually how it appeared in the Google rankings, just default. Like that's no use to anyone. So uh, I, I, the reason I mention this is because you might think our oh, page titles, yeah, everyone talks about that. Government departments, people, big brands often get this wrong, or they just have home on their home page. They don't even have their brand name, that kind of stuff. Really important that you get this right. Okay, does that make sense? Is this new to people, or is this kind of, you, you knew this before? How many people this, is this new to? Is this kind of, okay, good. So that's good. Thanks for that. Just want to make sure I'm um, just telling you stuff that's useful. Now, the second thing, oh, le actually, let me just, I know you probably know this, but I'll just flip into the page source for Fire Boot Camp. And this is this section here. Here's the two things. So when we talk about page title, that's it, the, the title there. Can you, can you actually see that at the back? Joanna, you might not be able to read that. Sorry. Let me just see if I can zoom in. Why is my plus not working? There we go. Is that a bit easier to read? There we go. So th these are the things that I'm talking about, the page title and the code behind. Now, how you set that, if you're just writing pure HTML, you could obviously just set that yourself. But quite often, the way you set that's different based on how you're developing it or whether you're using a content management system um, and, yeah, the, the kind of framework that you're building your site with. Those kind of specifics we might look at after the presentation, depending on how you're building your sites. But that's important that you set that for each page. Now, this second one, which is the meta description, this normally flows, Google normally picks that up to put here. Now, what's interesting is in Fire Bootcamp, and this is good, I, I kind of like to show you this because this is an example of where we didn't quite get <laughs> Fire Boot Camp optimized early on. It's only been up for a couple of months, but um, we've only now set this description because that's actually what we want it to say, become a world-class uh, beginner.net developer. That's actually what we want it to say here. But we're lucky because Google's actually pulled, that actually description's actually quite good. But where have they got that from? What Google's done is when they've crawled the page, they've actually pulled it here from some text in the content of the page. And it's kind of lucky that they've pulled that and not something that was a bit off topic. But we actually have the chance 
to influence what Google uses in these two things. Now, let me tell you, the, I said the page titles are really important because that guides Google on how to rank the page and for what terms. This, job des this meta description, it actually has no influence on rankings. So you might think, well, if it doesn't actually influence the ranking, why would we do it? The reason is you should write that so that it's like a call to action, okay? Because when you get actually, let's say I go um, for a term, SharePoint consultants maybe. So here's uh, a re results for this. See how there's a whole bunch of things competing for our attention? Like which one do I click? It's, um, it's actually hard. What we actually want to do is make this description the most compelling to be clicked through. Because if you're lucky enough to be competing with someone that doesn't set their meta descriptions properly, they might just have garbage or Google's pulled their menu structure or something in. And you can often, actually maybe not often, but you can, uh, for some of the time, even if you're not the top ranking result, say you're two or three, if you have a more compelling description here, you'll get more click-throughs. So this is actually really important. You'll get more traffic even though you don't rank as high. So that's why I'm harping on those two. And they are set from the page title and the meta description. So those two things are the most important thing that you can do for your site to help with SEO. So that's, if nothing else today, take away that, that, um, that little tip. Okay, let me just flip back to PowerPoint. Any questions on that? Any thoughts? Okay. Here, so what I'll say is, you might think, well, what do I put in the, um, what do I actually put in that page title? And I would say if you're starting a new site, especially the home page, put your brand terms in there. Okay? You'll often see page titles where it says, welcome to the best site about blah, blah, blah. Share it. Put your brand terms there, especially if you're getting it started. Okay. Now, I, I skipped over a few of these slides. Uh, we got up to there. I'm actually going to give you a little bit of an SEO checklist. I'm going to explain a few of these, and then I'm going to jump into tools. Okay. Is this all making sense so far? Google crawls the web. They're crawling pages, and they're looking for stuff on your sites. We've talked about page titles. We've talked about page meta descriptions. And the third one you can use is headings on the page to influence what Google ranks it for and what they think the page is about. That's why even, probably um, Fire Boot Camp's not the, the best example, but just the use of headings throughout the page can influence if these are headings. This is a guide to Google, yeah, development managers, new.net developers, maybe that's what the site's about. Okay, so that's the first three, page titles, page meta descriptions, which are done in the code behind or in your content management system, headings, which is the content that you have on the site, uh, and of course, the content that you write about, the more you can match that to the aud your audience, the better. Uh, guides Google. Now, one of the things about um, SEO that, uh, and the web as web developers that we should be doing is this concept of test and measure, okay? Everything we should do has a test and measure aspect when it comes to rankings. That is, we try something, we test it, and we measure whether it works. So then the obvious question is, well, how do we measure it? And that's where Google Analytics comes in. So I'm going to dive into Google Analytics in a second. I did want to mention um, the robots.txt file. Is, are people familiar with this? Who's come across the robot? So no one's come? Yep, one or two has come across the robots.txt file. I'll tell you what that is, uh, just to get it out of the way, and also XML sitemaps. So have you heard of XML sitemaps as well? Yeah, okay, so they might be more familiar with that. I'll tell you what the first, uh, what the robots uh, file is. We'll just jump to that and then I'll come back to Google Analytics. Here's the robots.txt file. This is a file that sits on your server. Um, quite often you'll just generate the file itself or your content management system can look after it sometimes. And what it is, it's actually a directive to uh, the search engines as to what they can and can't, or what they should and shouldn't, crawl on your site. Now it's called the robots, 
uh, .txt file because it's uh, applying to the Google crawlers and robots or the search bots that crawl through your site. So it's not really for people to look at, it's for the search engine crawlers to look at. Now this has a lot of power over your site and uh, you can use it uh, to block the entire site or just to block parts of it. So let me tell you the use cases you might have. If you're building a staging site for a client and you've got it publicly available, which you might have to do because there's external testers or for a variety of reasons, you can actually use your robots.txt file to completely block it from Google. Because there's nothing worse than in the Google results turning up some staging site, especially if you're about to launch something that's you know, maybe time sensitive or it's got some new features. You don't want that turning up in Google results. So you can block it and on the left there I've given you the, the directive that you can use to block everything. And it's basically saying disallow the entire site. So that's great for staging. The problem is often when staging sites go live and maybe they're replacing an existing site, you can see what's, hap what's going to happen, right? People copy over their robots file and it blocks the entire production site. And this happens more often than you'd think. It happens all the time. Just over Christmas, I had a client, their entire site, just they'd been testing something, basically dropped out of Google for a couple of weeks because someone had incorrectly set the robots.txt file. So this is something you should all be aware of. And um, it, should, it should actually be part of uh, one of your checklist items when, when a staging goes to production. I don't know how, you can probably automate this somehow um, in your CI routines or whatever, but it should just basically check that robots isn't blocking everything. Now the second one here on the right, the go live, your user agent, you can just get it to block, yes, Okay, so the question is, in, in, Azure words, in Azure websites, I always say Azure, but <laughs> in your website, you have that process. Now, I'm not sure what happens, what Microsoft's process is, so you might actually have to have a manual check, but I would imagine that if it's already set under your staging folder, it's going to get copied over. I don't know what scripts you use, maybe it doesn't co copy text scripts, I'm not sure. But let's assume it gets copied over. You're actually going to have to come up with some... Um, some checkpoint as part of that uh, staging copy that checks the robots.txt file or maybe pulls over an existing one or maybe just doesn't copy that over because you know that the one on your production site. Do you have a, a comment on that, Adam, how it's that would... Interesting. I, I've, I've actually made a note of it to have a look at it. The way Azure works with staging is it actually has two versions of the website and what it actually does is it does a virtual IP swap. Ah, uh, right. So Okay. Um, so my, my, my thing would be is we probably will have a look at routing. Because, so robots.txt is just the website address forward slash robot.txt. Yes. So we could add, we could dynamically generate robots.txt. As long as it looks to Google forward slash robot.txt returns a text file. Yes. That would be okay. So if we had a route that dynamically generated it, yes. depending on whether or not it was our staging instance. Yeah, that, that, that would be a good solution, so yes. So I think the answer for our Azure sites is going to be not to actually have a robot.txt, but to have a custom route mm. that returns robots.txt based on whether or not it's staging or not staging. Mm. So we'll actually have to have it in code so that whenever you so every website will be able to return mm. code. Yeah, so that's a good solution. I'll just repeat that for the mic. So what, what I'm saying is basically that file will be generated um, dynamically. And actually, this is the way WordPress works most of the time. WordPress, there's not actually a physical .txt file on the server. It's, it is generated dynamically. And if you have plugins, they often hook into that. And you, So in your SEO plugin on WordPress, I don't know if many of you use WordPress, but if it says... Um, or even actually the default WordPress, it'll say hide this from search engines. It's actually putting that robots.txt um, uh, file, virtual file in place. So I think you're quite right. On the Azure side, you should probably generate that. So that's, yeah, that's a good solution. 
Okay, now the, the advantage of, you might think, well, why do we even have it on the, on the production side at all, you know? And the reason is quite often you do want to hide folders um, from Google. You just don't want them uh, searching stuff. So you might have an FTP directory that you don't want Google somehow finding and crawling or things like that. So that's where you can actually put these disallow um, directives in and block folders or specific files and all that kind of stuff in robots.txt. So that's something definitely to check. It's becoming more important because in the past, if you just didn't have a robots.txt file, it was, it was generally okay. It's kind of like Google assumed if it wasn't there, well, we'll just crawl everything. Sometimes you find, though, that especially if you're refreshing a, a pre-existing site, you find if they did have a robots.txt file in the past, Google's expecting it. And so then when you put the new site there, you, you kind of say, oh, I'll get rid of robots altogether. We don't need it. We don't need to block anything. Google is actually expecting to see it. And what they tend to do now, if they're expecting to see a robots file and it isn't there, they tend to assume, well, we best be careful and block the entire site. And that's quite often how you see it happen. So just something to be aware of. Very important. OK, robots. Um, sorry, back to my checklist. That was robots. And the other one was the XML sitemap. Nowhere near as important as the robots file, but is a guide. It's just an XML markup of the pages that you want to guide Google to look at. And it's just a file that you put in that same directory. And when we look at Google Webmaster Tools, we'll look at how we actually tell Google to look at that sitemap. And it's, it's just a guide. So if an XML sitemap is a guide to Google, robots is the gate. OK, so make sure the gate's open and then guide it all you want. But what I want to do now is I actually want to um, flip over to Google Analytics and, and kind of walk you through that for a little while because I, I think it's really important and uh, something that you'll find really interesting ab about your site. So here's the tools that we're going to look at today, uh, time permitting. Um, and I probably should check time. There we go. Uh, Google Analytics, Google Webmaster Tools. We might have a look at Google AdWords if we have time and there's interest. Uh, we'll look at some keyword tools and there's a whole bunch of other tools now. There's millions of tools, right? <laughs> if you ever want to lose a weekend, just go and look up some SEO tools and, and go crazy. It's, it's kind of one of those things. Or if you like to procrastinate and you don't want to actually do work, <laughs> go, and, go and find a new SEO tool to play with, all right? I do it all the time. But even yeah, right. <laughs> It's like that. What's the new framework? Oh, what's the new SEO tool? Anyway, so what is Google Analytics? You probably know this. Um, it tracks visitor sources, behaviors, conversions, and things. Now, if you don't already have a Google account, you'll need to set one up. That's really easy. Or just set up a Gmail account and then create your account. And we'll actually pop into Analytics now, and I'll, I'll just walk you through what it looks like. So I'm going to show you the... Um, Actually, let me just ask, who's, who's actually played with Google Analytics? One, two, okay. So most of you haven't. So most of this will be new to you, I'm, I'm assuming. Let me, let me just uh, collapse all these. Here's, here's the interface. You come in. Um, later, we'll look at how to implement this on your site. Basically, it's a bit of JavaScript. You just put on your site, and it starts tracking. But what it tracks after a while is you get all these stats. Now, this is the Fire Bootcamp site, which, as I said, is pretty new. So they, these numbers are, are not huge yet, but um, they're at least indicative we can get some interesting um, insights into what people are doing on the site. Now, what you do is you come in, and there's a whole bunch of menu stuff I won't go into, but down the left-hand side, are the main sections. And there's three main sections that you're thinking about in analytics. You're thinking about um, who's coming to my site, how did they get here, and what are they doing? They're kinds of the questions that you're asking. Who are they? You know, what country? Um, what device? Um, how did they get here? Was it from Google? Was it from AdWords? Was it a referral site? And three, what are they doing? Which is stuff like what pages are they visiting? How long are they staying on pages? That kind of thing. So that's when we have this audience section. That's who are they? Acquisition is how do they get here? And behavior is what are they doing? I just wanted to jump into a few of these reports to kind of show you the kind of stuff you can get out about your site. Okay. 
Now, I told you at the start that my background was a database developer, right? So I love data and analyzing data. So this kind of gets me excited, but I realize that might not be the case for everyone. So if, you, uh, if I see you kind of nodding off, I'll, I'll just realize this is not that exciting to most people, okay? But to me, it's like... And also, uh, kind of, the reason this is important is if you're optimizing your site, working out what people are doing and liking is kind of important. And if you're working for a big client, it's kind of like, well, what are all the people on their site doing? Maybe that's going to influence how we, you know, the, the IA, the information architecture that we set up for the new site or whatever. Analytics is a, like a good source that feeds into a whole bunch of stuff. Now, I'll, I'll, before I get into each of these three sections, I'll look at the real-time section. This is really cool. So on the food Fire Bootcamp site, let's say I go to a page. Um, the syllabus. It's firing, is it? A little bit slow. Oh, I think I've lost my... Oh, no, it's coming back. gone to one of the pages. Actually, let me just bring this back to actual size. I'd zoomed in before, but um, so this is the, the site. If we go over and look over at real time, this is a section. This is a quite nice. It tells you real time what people are doing on your site. And um, there's one visitor. That's, that's me, obviously. So it would be nice if there were lots more, but you know, that's, that's the way the site is at the moment. Um, if you, uh, you might think, well, what's a, what's a, what's a high traffic site? And so, say you're on a big government site that's getting uh, millions of visitors per year, you might think, oh, well, how many active visitors have they got? Often it's just between 50 and 100. You might think, that's actually quite a lot. So if you're ever looking at analytics and you're getting 50 to 100 um, active visitors on your site, you actually know that's, you're doing actually okay. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, how does Google Analytics compare to Red Sheriff? I don't know what Red Sheriff oh, is. Ah, so it's an analytics package. I think it was, yeah. Okay, well let's let's Google it. Is that website traffic statistics? Okay, well the the. I don't know the answer to that particular question, but the question is good because it's like, is Google Analytics the only analytics package? No, there's hundreds of them. Um, Google Analytics is free, which makes it very popular. Most of the other analytics packages uh, are paid and they, there's quite a range. So you can get something like Clicky or Get Clicky, which is actually one I use a fair bit um, for on sites and I think it's like $9 a month. Uh, there's others that focus on particular features, like KISS metrics is another very popular one. And I use that on some sites where we want to actually get more personally identifiable information about the visitors. One of the things, and it actually raises a good point, which is within, within analytics, you'll never see, oh, five, is that all you? <laughs> thank you. Yeah, they're all, they're all from Sydney, <laughs> so thank you for that. We have got such a popular site. I mean, it's just going off, trending. But um, with analytics, there is nothing ever personally identifiable, okay? And that's actually in Google Analytics standard terms and conditions. Um, so much so that when you go and do AdWords stuff, um, they actually make it when you do remarketing. I don't, we, we won't go into that today, but remarketing is basically where ads follow you around. Have you ever done that? You go to a site and then wherever you go, it's like, I'm just seeing their banner ads everywhere. And it, it, it can be good or it can be annoying, depending on your point of view and whether you're the advertiser. But that kind of stuff can get close to personally identifiable because what you can do is you can actually kind of drive people into silos on your site and work out who they are. You might send them a specific email just to a page and then you've kind of been able to tag them. Google Analytics doesn't let you do that. They say nothing personally identifiable. And in fact, if you're doing advertising campaigns that break that, they'll often close your account. The reason I'm mentioning all of that is because other analytics packages do allow you to do it. Red Sheriff might have been one of those, tied in directly. Yeah. And so while analytics is free and really useful and by far the most popular, other analytics packages will give you more stuff 
uh, especially when you want to get into a lot of that data mining and really specific behavioral analysis. So any other questions straight away? That was a, that's a good question. Yeah, that was a good one. Okay. Yeah. So the question was, what do these bars actually mean um, as they scroll along? And they're basically indicating. Uh, so the you probably can't see it, but the the, the y-axis here in um, per second is that's a one where those are, and that's saying there's one visitor, or actually one page view probably per second there. So if we all jump on now, let me actually <laughs> flick around. Um, you should see these uh, boost up. So we, I was hoping we might see that jump up to two for, for some of it. I think we both think the same link in almost the same time. Yeah, might be. And then why is the dense, so the bars don't seem to be coming through every second though, they seem to be getting denser as opposed to... That's because there's several assertions and potentially different pages all at once. There is a little bit of a delay. So let me, let me just jump to something that you're probably not on. I'll jump to the blog page. And that you'll see a little delay before it pops into these active pages. I'll be one of these visitors already, and then you'll see it switch over to blog probably. There it goes, that one. So there's actually a delay of a couple of seconds. It's not super real time. Um, there is a delay of, which, which is probably fine. But yeah, that's pro oh, here we go. So there we got a four. You, you, you might not be able to see that on the screen, but that's actually four. We had four people there at that same point on the site, you know, within that few seconds where it was capturing. So that's what those mean. And then, so this is per second, this one here with the, the tiny bars, and then this is uh, per minute, so you get a 30 minute kind of window of activity. So in this section, two minutes ago, we had about 16 page views on the site. So right now we've got seven. This is just, we're nailing it. Um, locations and so traffic sources it'll, it'll also tell you where they came from so someone came organically so did anyone type in Google and then wonder if that's me no no I, I came direct someone has actually come via the search engine so that's useful yeah so that's cool so it's telling you at any one time and now why that's good is sometimes um, if you're if you're a big brand and you're running a competition and let's say you've just announced some sponsored tweet on Twitter or something and you just see suddenly your your social sources um, ramp up. So that can be quite cool. So if I, if I was coming from a link on Twitter, I'd see Twitter as a source. Yeah, it would probably appear as, um, it'll either, either appear as social, the medium, or if you're ever in analytics and see t.co as the referral source, that's Twitter. Yeah. Question. Uh, sorry, I don't quite understand the question. Can uh, uh, we can see the analytics of any website. Uh, you are opening with this Firebook camp. Oh, so right. The one or other site or so site. the question is, can you view the analytics for someone else's site? Yeah, yeah. And the answer to that is possibly if they give you permission. But there's a process where you've got to put the, you create an analytics account, you put the script on your site, and then you have permissions to view that analytics account. I have permission to view the Fire Boot Camp site and a bunch of my client sites, but there's no way I can tap in to see what's trending on BuzzFeed or something, you know, and yeah, unless they gave me access. I won't go into it today, but there's a whole bunch of stuff under this admin section where you have user management and things like that where you can give all kinds of permissions. You can give some people just access to reports and specific areas of the site, but I'll just go back to reporting. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, good question. So the, the question is, is, it, is analytics covered by privacy legislation? It probably depends country specific, but I know in Australia most people will put a, a, um, a little disclaimer, and in our privacy section I'm pretty sure we've got it here, that says we do collect information about you. Now what's important, and it's, it's actually another really good question because, um, yeah, here we go. 
personal information collected from websites where we talk about what is collected and how we collect it. Now, we've actually, this is actually going into a bit of detail, but because we use remarketing for the Fire Boot Camp site, you know, remember I said we, we follow you around the web with banner ads? Uh, and they work really well. You might love them or hate them. But we actually have to give people, this is in Google's uh, terms and conditions, we actually have to give them an opt out option. So we do that here where you can actually opt out, actually it's this second bit here, you can opt out of that remarketing cookie. So whether that, whether, whether legally in Australia we have to do that, I'm not exactly sure. I think so. There's some, you should mention it. But this second bit about giving opt out, that's a Google uh, requirement. Oh, right. Yeah, right. Right. It's a good question. So the, the comment there, just uh, uh, for people, was um, that at Telstra, whenever they publish a new piece of content or a new section of the site, you're always getting the call from legal saying, have you done the privacy checklist? And it's, it's a good question. I don't really know the specifics of what I require, but I think it's a really good thing that you'd have to work out for which, whichever client you were working for. Okay, so that's Google Analytics. Any other questions on that before we I'll push on? Okay, so that's real time. I'll just dig into some of the other sections, the audience. Now what's, what's cool about this, I'll just pick on a few. We can actually have a look. Now once we've gone out of real time, we're now into a date range of people visiting the site and that's actually you can see the date range I've got here up on the top right we're just looking at the last month you can change that to the last years or, or whatever last week if you want uh, so it gives you some roll roll ups on stats we can see that Australia gives us the most um, traffic United States India Brazil that's probably Tiago just maintaining the site I'd say one of the SSW developers uh, yeah, and so that's, that can be quite interesting. Um, that's always interesting if you're targeting an Australian audience and suddenly you're getting a whole lot of traffic from the Philippines or something which looks a little bit like it's probably not the traffic you wanted or something like that. So that can be useful. Or Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe, <laughs> yep. Russia. Uh, so a lot of, lot of linked networks in Russia that would um, build the spammy links, yeah, and you're getting a lot of Russian traffic that's it's probably <laughs> probably not a good sign. Don't know. There's a bunch of things like um, technology. The, the only other one I'll look at here in the audience section is um, this overview of the mobile because mobile is becoming, as you would know, um, far more important. We don't get a lot of mobile or tablet traffic here yet. That's about 10% or maybe 12, 13%. But really, on, on a lot of sites, you're seeing that jumping up around 25, 40% even. Mobile's increasing, especially on tech sites. And you would imagine, if you get a lot of traffic from, say, social, from Twitter or something, a lot of that's going to be mobile traffic because people are tweeting stuff. They get a link, they just flick through, and that's when you'll see your mobile stuff go up. But um, uh, let, me, uh, let, let me ask you, what, wh we're going to look at the devices. What do you think the most popular device for viewing the site is going to be. PC. Sorry, what was that? Just a, just a PC. PC. Uh, sorry, in devices, we're going to look at mobile devices. Sorry. You, you'd be quite right, PC. Under the mobile section, I'm just going to drill into. Android. Android. How many for Android? How many for Apple? So most are, most are Android. OK, here's what we got iPhone. All, all hipsters, yeah. <laughs> well, that's right. <laughs> Sorry, say that again. Where's that? Yeah, it probably is. Yeah. And the other thing is, these numbers are so low that they're pretty unreliable anyway. Like, you really wanted to be getting thousands of visits to draw some conclusions. But yeah, it's always interesting. iPhone and iPad and on most client sites that I look at, they're the, they're the big uh, device usage. So 
seems to be the case. And, and I'm talking mostly about Australia, actually, when I made that last comment. Most, yeah, Australian science. Um, yeah, I think so. And I have seen stats where they look at that and they say the, the internet consumption by mobile device is um, there's more people with Android, but there's more pages viewed with Apple. Yeah. That'll probably change. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, that's a good, so I'll just repeat the comment. The comment is, yeah, that's an important consideration for design and testing. What tools you test your sites on. Take a look at analytics to see whether there's particular devices that get a lot of traffic and make sure you're testing for those. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Is it? Yeah. Maybe that maybe Apple's still ahead. And it's uh, over in America where it actually starts to change. OK. You might be right. So the comment there is maybe Australia was still more iOS centric. You, you might be right. I don't actually know those the stats. That's no comment. Is there any information <coughs> Ah, good question. How they came. Um, so the question is, can you tell the app that they came from? I don't know the full answer to that question, but I can tell you that when you can tell whether they've come from apps, especially when you're looking at the advertising traffic. But the, there is an issue with mobile as well that um, quite often when it looks, when you look at the acquisition source, probably a good lead into acquisition source, um, I'll just show you the channels. One of the problems that uh, we've had with trying to gauge mobile visitors, I'll explain what these are. In, in, actually, no, let me explain that first and I'll come back to your question. In terms of channel, uh, channel sources, you know, we talked about organic and we've talked about pay, there's this thing called direct traffic. And direct traffic is, it basically means we don't really know where they came from. They might have just typed it directly into the address bar and they came through as direct traffic. But what we often found in some of the early devices, and iOS 6 was a key one here with Safari, even if you typed in Google, you're in Google on their browser and you typed and came through, that actually came through as direct traffic and analytics. So we were kind of blocked from even seeing where the source they came from. But then your further question is, well, what app was it, the Twitter app they came through? I'm not exactly sure because quite often those apps, they just have a, a, um, a control that has the Safari browser in it anyway. Or maybe if you're on the Gmail app, it's got a, a, a version of the Chrome browser involved. So. It, it's actually hard to tell what, exactly how they came through, and they probably just come through as either direct or maybe as an, uh, a visit, uh, a referral visit. So I, I don't have a good answer for you, actually. It is, it's a good question. I should answer more. Adam. Uh, Craig, have they tried to um, reduce that problem by uh, tacking on that UDM in all the URLs? Okay, so Adam's question is, can we get more visibility about where they came from using, they're called UTM parameters. And I don't know if you've ever seen these. Um, actually, I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's go to Twitter. And I'll just click on something that's been shared, and you'll normally see uh, Instagram's probably not a good one. This one should have it. So there's the TCA link coming from Twitter. Now, this when it expands out, probably have some UTM parameters, so I'll just tell you what they are. Um, no, it doesn't, damn it. Okay, here's, here's one here. This is, this, is what, this is what you're talking about, Adam, these UTM parameters at the end. Now, these parameters, this is kind of a little bit off track, but these parameters are signals that you can t give to analytics about where you came from the source. Now, what's interesting about this is that they're saying source is deliberate, which is actually a social sharing tool. Um, or if you might have seen Buffer or Hootsuite or any of these things, they tag their parameters at the end. So that will actually come up in the analytics that would come up as a source deliverer. It's probably going to get grouped under social uh, and the medium would be Twitter. Now, they can help you work out where they came from, but they could actually cloud it because I've come from a browser here on the Twitter site, but actually that's going to uh, appear as um, a social 
um, actually it's probably social is okay, but it's actually it's actually almost maybe confused it a bit much for you. But where UTM parameters can be useful is you can set these, uh, and if, if you want to get into this, just look up um, uh, Google URL Builder. You can actually build these yourself so that when you uh, build a link in, you, you use this little builder and it builds a submit. It builds those parameters and appends it to your URL so you get those parameters. Where they come through is they'll often impact these channels. I know I'm jumping around a bit here. Just try and follow me and I'll, I'll come back and review some of these. If we look at all traffic, where do they come from? See how analytics has broken this down by source and medium? And that's where we can influence those using those UTM parameters. We can say the source was this, the medium was this. That's why you get Facebook as a source. Oh, sorry, I'll just pop back. Uh, YouTube as a source, it's a referral source. TCO as a referral. You can get those kinds of things. So that can actually help you, and it helps you control where they come from. So even if that was shared on an app, on your Twitter app on that, that would come through and set those source parameters. So you can influence that. But if someone else shares your your link and uses their own UTM parameters, you've got no control of that. So it can, it's, it can be good and bad. That was a bit of a long-winded answer. Does that actually answer your question? Yeah. So we, we jumped around a little bit um, there. And I've jumped into acquisition. Were there any other questions um, just around these traffic sources? Because um, I did jump into that. But this is basically saying how we get traffic to the Fireboot campsite. Google Organic and direct to the biggest. Yeah. Can you cheat your traffic with bots and detect it? OK, so the question is, can you artificially boost your traffic using bots? Is, is that right? Yeah. yeah. And the, question, the answer is, yes, you can. But there's a few things that you have to do. Um, the Google Analytics script normally waits for the page to load and then fires. So if you're just hitting a bot that's just you know, you've just set up a Mechanical Turk thing or something that's just hitting the site, that probably actually won't be recorded in Google Analytics, although it might be on your web stats, your actual server logs, it'd probably be there. But the bots are getting much clever now, cleverer now, um, where they can drive the link, they wait for the page to load, and they also just click around the site, they wait random seconds and click the pages. There's tons of tools that you can, can do that to artificially yeah, inflate your stats. So, and if you ever try, <laughs> this is one of the big scams that people do. What's that site where you flip websites? Just forgot the name. There's a. Uh, I'll come back to me. But if you ever want to sell your website, you go on and you can sell it. And people often put these inflated traffic stats because when you're buying a website, you think, oh, he's a ready-made audience and it's got this much traffic, and they use the bots for that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah. So that's the answer to that. Any other questions? Now, actually, it does raise another question, though, and that is um, Google, Anal Google Analytics is not 100% precise. And so because there there's, there's any number of reasons why the JavaScript script might not fire. Um, one might be you just don't have JavaScript enabled in your browser. Um, it could be it doesn't wait long enough to fire. You click the back button, got to wait. The reason to mention this is because you should always just use analytics as kind of a trend or a relative um, reporting tool. And so if you're ever on a site and they give you access to their web logs, you know, you look at the IIS logs and you see a million visits, and you go into analytics and you only see 700,000. You, you need, to, need to look at that and say, well, was this actually an issue? You know, maybe analytics wasn't firing on every page. Or is it just because the traffic, that 300,000 was bots or other things, people crawling it? Most analytics will filter out most, most of the search engine crawler bots, but some of them it won't. And so that can, that can skew um, your traffic. But analytics is always just an insight tool. And 
when you, uh, when you actually get into really high traffic sites, like if you're looking at, say, a million visitors per month and stuff like that, analytics actually won't give you the full number. It actually just shows you a sample. It might say 30% of the traffic it uses as a sample to show you relative numbers, and it kind of extrapolates it. Okay, so that was acquisition, and analytics also covers if you've got an AdWords account linked up, things like that. It can uh, give you insights into that. The, but the third one I just really uh, wanted to look at was behavior, and that's what, what are they doing on your site? And here's what they're doing on the Fire Bootcamp site. Here's the visits. This is also probably a good time to talk about some of these engagement stats. So there's a lot of numbers on the screen, and uh, are you fading yet? Are you kind of, I, I, find, this, I find this so exciting. <laughs> And if you're finding this completely boring, then I totally understand. I, I just, I, I get it. it's not for everyone. But uh, so, if I'm going into too much detail, just you know, start giving the signals. But here's the pages that they're visiting. Um, here's the number of page views. Here's the number of unique page views. So a unique page view means a unique visitor, but they might visit two pages. So there's one unique page view. Well, sorry, they might refresh it. So there's one unique page view, but there's two actual page views. Time on page and bounce rate. Who knows what the bounce rate is? Bounce rate, yep. Anyone else know the bounce rate? I'll tell you, it's, it's an interesting stat. So bounce rate is often confusing, but it's basically if they came to that page and did they go on to another page. So they arrived at a page, did they continue or did they leave your site? And bounce rate could be good or bad. Um, it, it's, it's in a percentage. So this, this means 34% of people came to the home page, which we're on at the moment. 34% came, and then they, um, uh, they didn't leave. Sorry, 34% of them left, so 66% of them stayed. So the higher the bounce rate, Normally the worse that is, like if you've got a 95% bounce rate, it means 95% of people arrived at the page and then left. Now you might think that's a bad thing, and it usually is, but it might not be. Because if you've just got a blog post that answers a question, people find it in Google, they get their answer and then they leave, that's perfectly fine. But for another thing like the home page, if they've arrived and then they leave, it might probably means they weren't ideal traffic. Because you'd expect them, if they were good traffic, to get to the home page and go further. Now, you might say, well, how's it calculated? Um, I think it's a 30-minute window. So it's kind of like if you arrived on the site and if you, if you didn't go on to another page within 30 minutes, I, th I think that's the time frame. Could be, could be less or more. But that's, a, it's, that's the general statistic. And then the average time they spent on the page. So of the people that came, um, they arrived on the page, and then they did something else so that we could actually track. They didn't just leave, so we could actually see how long. That was the average of the people that stayed. So these are typically referred to as engagement stats. And quite often engagement is more important than the volume of traffic. Because if you're getting millions of visitors, but the, the bounce rate's super high on every page, they're not staying, they're not engaging, then that's probably not good traffic. Whereas you have very focused traffic, and if they're engaged and staying, that's probably more useful. So it kind of makes sense in that regard. But it's just one of those things that when you're thinking about analytics, don't just think about pure traffic. Think about what they're actually doing on your, on, on your site. 34% is quite good, isn't it? 34% is good. Most people hit the home page and they went, this is interesting. 65% of people who hit the home page hit the home Correct. So just to give you some ballparks, uh, if, if Anything uh, less than 60% or lower is a good bounce rate. Just I if you just want like a, a broad uh, number, 60% from organic is 60% um, or lower is good. If you're getting paid advertising, say AdWords, 80% or lower is good. Ideally, you want it as low as possible, but that's just to give you some relativities because quite often advertising is less targeted and um, might just be driving traffic. Now that's case by case, of course, but just in, just as a, a rough rule of thumb, if you're seeing 90% bounce rate, it's just something to look at. Could be fine, as I said, if it's a blog post that answers the question, but just something to look at. 
So question, yeah. Okay, so it's a good question, and uh, there's no easy answer to it. I'll just repeat the question. So the question is, um, some of these big sites that might have a very, be in a very competitive market, they've very much personalised the landing pages. Let's call them landing pages, specifically for target audiences. So whatever it is, you know, a specific gender or um, age group or socioeconomic factor, they've tweaked the page specifically for that and they're probably coming probably not so much organic but they're driving it with paid advertising because in the advertising you know you can get quite um, specific about the demographics that you're targeting so you might say say on Facebook you're saying I'm going to pick this age group this people that live in this location or whatever I'm just going to drive them to this specially tailored landing page just for them so the, that, that's kind of the, the setup you're talking about. And the question is, how does that impact overall optimization of the site? Probably, just talking in generalisms, they're probably not trying to rank all those thousands of landing pages. They're, they're purpose-built for campaigns. Organically, they're probably just going to a main, few main pages, and they're the ones they're optimizing for, for Google. In fact, they're probably blocking Google from seeing all these landing pages because they don't want that, you know, um, confusing all their results. Google, Google only gives you a certain amount of resource. You know, that's not an infinite resource. And so you kind of sometimes, if you've got thousands of pages, you actually want to be quite efficient about which ones you allow in the Google index. Now, there's various ways you can do that. You can actually use robots.txt to block a whole, you know, folder of all those landing pages perhaps but yet yeah, overall optimization is probably going to be on only a subset of those pages mainly to get the, the broader Google organic traffic those landing pages are probably going to be for paid or campaigns could be email campaigns could be any number of things uh, and the other thing to mention about there that is that you can get tools that uh, you can actually personalize the page kind of on the fly so you don't actually have to develop thousands of individual pages and trying to maintain that, you can actually have them dynamically generated and there's any number of tools that do that or you might even do it within your own system and you know there's hundreds of ways to kind of skin that cat. Does that actually answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions around that? And that's a general answer by the way. <laughs> your mileage may vary. There'll be specific cases obviously where we look at it. All right, so I'll, I'll quickly uh, jump through a bunch of these. There's things like exit pages. Oh, let's, let's look at landing pages. So the one we looked at before was just all the pages. You can actually look at landing pages, which is pages where people land on. So this is how, you know, how many land on the home page as opposed to just maybe visiting it after that. All these stats, again, are useful uh, to you. Um, there are some site speed things, a whole bunch of other behaviours. There's events that you can set up, so you can actually track things. You can actually raise or fire Google Analytics events. Now, it's outside the scope of the talk today, but Google has a whole API, API behind it that you can pull out data, but you can also um, programmatically push um, events to Google, to, to, uh, to Analytics to track. So if there's a particular button, I'll give you an example. Say there's a button, a form submit button on your page. You can actually put a little bit of a event code that gets fired when that's clicked to raise an event in Google. And then you, there's, we're not going to talk about it today, but you can have goals that you set up in Google. And then you, you can kind of see how powerful this would be. At the end of each week or month, you look at, well, how many conversions did we get from that form and where did they come from? So we might have had a thousand visitors to the site from Google, 
but actually the only sign-ups we had came from social or something like that. So that's all useful information. So I think I've probably spent enough time in analytics. Any other questions on analytics before I... Yes. Uh, so I, I have an e-commerce site. Mm -hmm. Plus, uh, visitors are coming to visit my site. Yes. Okay, so your question is, you've got an e-commerce site, yeah. got all this traffic, you need to make money, so you've got to work out what parts or what segments of that traffic are actually buying stuff. Yes. Okay, so it's a good question, and really what you'd be looking at is conversion goals. And I, I won't, we won't go into it today, but there's this thing, I, I'm jumped into the admin section, there's the things for goals. You can set up goals, and you can do this manually, or if you've got an e-commerce plug-in, quite often they automatically feed into this. And you can set up goals for a whole bunch of things. They might be purchases, they might be just signing up for a newsletter, all those kind of things. Now, though, once those are set up, they can then feed into any of these reports. So see how there's this conversions section? It's, just, it's on almost probably half the reports in analytics. Um, you can start tracking which ones convert and it actually gets better than just a goal conversion. Depending on the system you're using, you can actually have e-commerce tracking. And it's a section, let me just close this down, in conversions, this is a whole separate section called e-commerce. It will actually feed in everything, including if your system has been inputting this into analytics, the purchase price, the volume, the transaction cost, all of those things. And you can actually pull out all your sales stats in uh, from analytics. So it's great for um, purchases, one-off purchases. If you've got actually a subscription site that has, say, monthly payments, it's a little bit trickier because you, you get the first payment, but you won't see the subsequent months usually. That, that's not fed in. But yeah, is that, does that answer your question? Yeah. That's kind of, yeah. So look into, just, just Google e-commerce tracking and analytics. And what's your e-commerce platform are you using? Is it something you custom built or is it an uh, off-the-shelf product? Just to my mind. Um, right. Be, uh, the reason I was asking that is because depending on the platform, some of them just have this integrated in beautifully. Yeah. Okay, so that's conversion. So that, that's probably enough for um, analytics. Any, any other questions on analytics? Okay, so I'm going to jump back. But the thing is, I want you to today afterwards we'll set up analytics for each of your websites, assuming it's appropriate, um, and we'll walk through how to do that and you can start recording and, and tracking this data. And then you can spend hours, like I do, going through analytics each week. It's just, it's just exciting stuff. I've been running SSW for 20 years. I've also been a lecturer at the University of Technology, Sydney, for many years. And I think the gap is getting wider between what they're being taught and what employers need for the guys to hit the ground running and be able to do real work. Looking for a job as a junior developer can be really tough. There are so many applicants out there and you know it's really hard for an employer to separate one from the other. They try really hard, but it's a challenge for them. One of the problems when you come out of university is everything you learn at university isn't directly transferable into the enterprise. I think I've seen all the problems that companies are having with new recruits. That's why we created Bootcamp. The Bootcamp is a place where you'll go for nine weeks, 40 to 60 hours a week, and do one thing and one thing only. That is learn to code in Microsoft technologies. You're gonna be learning MVC5, HTML5, uh, these technologies are really important because the uptake in the industry is huge. So this course will just fill that gap between university and starting work. At the boot camp you have a mentor and that mentor gets you over a challenge you may have straight away so you can go on to the next challenge. Instead of sitting there for hours searching Google and trying to find answers that sometimes you just can't find. It's important to have a mentor because it stops you going off track. It stops you getting stuck on things that aren't really important. It happens time and time again where people are going through things that are found on the internet. What they really need is experience and hands-on coding. 
And this boot camp is gonna give people the hands-on experience in coding for nine weeks. Because if you can do as opposed to learn, you have your best chance at getting job ready for your first job in the industry. It's not an easy course. For nine weeks, you're thrown into the fire. You live and breathe .NET code. You live and breathe learning best practices and working as part of the team. You'll be working a minimum of 40 hours and mostly 60 hours a week, every week. Becoming job ready is more than just learning how to write code. You need to know how to work in a team, you, know, you need to know how to gather requirements, you need to know how to use the tool set, the Microsoft stack of tools. And during the boot camp, we're going to be teaching you all these other aspects, the soft skills of development that, you know, by yourself, learning from a book, learning through Google or videos, you just will never learn. It's not just coding skills, it's also communication skills and the ability to work as part of a small team. The whole course is run using Scrum, so you'll learn Scrum inside out. At SSW, we've been using Scrum since literally day one, so you'll learn from all our experiences and you'll just be able to join the company at the end of the course and you'll be able to fit straight in their team. So you'll be a big asset to any company that you join. One of the most exciting parts for the students is the gala at the end of the nine weeks. The gala is where you showcase what you've done to a room of prospective employers. This is where the rubber meets the road. At this gala, you're gonna be able to present the work that you've created and what you've learned, not to your mum and dad, but to real employers, people looking for junior developers. And at that gala, you're going to be able to present and then talk and, and discuss with them. And we're going to help you try and get a job at the end because we believe that the graduates of the boot camp are the best graduates on the market. And that is a damn lot better than sending your resume to recruiters who you can only hope will put your best foot forward. By spending nine weeks intensely in the boot camp, learning nothing and doing nothing but .NET programming, and then creating a real app that you can show your prospective employer is impressive. It's impressive because it shows you're passionate, and it shows that you've gone through an incredibly difficult course that most people would never go through. And that's the type of person that we look for at SSW.